Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. Well, Chooms, it has come to my attention that the man who wants to live forever has updated his stack for fighting hair loss. Once again, I'm talking about Brian Johnson, also known as the God Emperor of Arrakis. So this is definitely not the first time I've talked about Mr. Johnson. I've done several videos on him already, and I'll go ahead and link them below in case you haven't seen them yet. So some of those videos that I've made are about his attempts to achieve immortality, and why adding oral finasteride to his stack would help him do just that, not to mention that it would also help him save his hair. That's because finasteride has benefits in fighting off both heart disease and cancer, which are the top two causes of mortality in the human species. So it would make sense for a longevity guru like Mr. Johnson to be on oral finasteride since it is, after all, the ultimate anti-aging and longevity drug that is currently on the market. Later on, when Mr. Johnson finally did publish the ingredients in his hair loss topical tonic, I was happy to see that he at least included 0.25% topical finasteride in the mix as well as 5% topical minoxidil. However, he also decided to throw into his topical hair loss elixir a bunch of useless or nearly useless garbage like rosemary oil or ginkgo biloba as well as other ingredients with only the low lowest quality scientific research to justify their inclusion. It seems to me that Brian Johnson's scientific method is deeply flawed, and that's because he doesn't really consider the quality of research when he selects substances that he is going to self-experiment with. What he does is he'll just find anything that has even the weakest scientific evidence and then throw it into his stack hoping for the best. He is throwing the kitchen sink at the problem of hair loss and the problem of longevity and hoping that something will work somehow. He doesn't seem to consider the possibility that combining these eight agents might have negative effects or that one substance might counteract another. He also seems to put FDA-approved drugs like finasteride minoxidil on an equal footing with something like biotin as a treatment for hair loss, even though finasteride minoxidil have undergone years of vigorous research involving thousands of subjects, while the evidence for biotin is based on just 18 individual case reports. In reality, finasteride and minoxidil are probably the only things in a stack that are actually working, so his hair loss treatment stack is no better than what the majority of my viewers or myself are using. Or, I probably should say that finasteride minoxidil were the only things in his stack that were working, because like I said, he has recently changed his stack. He seems to be suffering from what is known in the hair loss community as hair loss ADD. That's because he never sticks to one drug regimen long enough for it to matter. He is constantly changing what he does to treat hair loss and to prolong his life. That became clear to me when one of my viewers sent me a Reddit post announcing that Brian Johnson had changed his hair loss stack yet again. But it looks like the original Reddit post has been deleted for some reason. However, if we head on over to Brian Johnson's Project Blueprint website, we can take a look at his latest hair loss recommendations. He currently has eight recommendations for fighting the slaphead curse. Some of these recommendations are the same as he made before, but notably, his drug treatment, including his topical formulation, has changed quite a bit. And to be clear, I don't disagree with all of his points. Not at all. For example, his first point is to start with a hair loss treatment as early as possible, and you know, that's definitely good advice, so props to Mr. Johnson there, and that's something I've been saying on my channel for years now, because there is strong medical evidence that the sooner you start treatment, the more effective that treatment will be. So, someone who begins finasteride as a Norwood 1 will have a much better response than someone who starts as a Norwood 2 or Norwood 3. Not only that, early onset androgenic alopecia has been shown to be more aggressive and is associated with other health conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and many other problems as well. That's why early diagnosis and treatment of androgenic alopecia are also very important. In fact, Brian Johnson even recommends starting treatment before there are visible signs of hair loss. I also agree with that because hair loss drugs are much better at maintenance than they are with regrowth. So if you start finasteride after you've already lost ground, there is no guarantee that you're going to get your hair back. So it is always better to start treatment before losing ground even if you are unsure if you have androgenic alopecia because it is always better to be safe than sorry. His second point on proper nutrition is fine too, though I think people can often overestimate the relationship between diet and hair health. In general, taking a bunch of vitamins and minerals is not going to help your hair with the possible exception of vitamin D, and I made a video on that which I'll link below. So having good nutrition is definitely not going to hurt your hair, certainly not, but it isn't going to do much good either. There are plenty of people who live like absolute slobs and they still have full heads of hair, and there are also people who are the absolute pinnacle of good health who are completely bald. So nobody who is going bald should think that the solution is fixing their diet. That will just make you a bald healthy man, which I 
suppose is better than being a bald, unhealthy man, but don't kid yourself. Food isn't going to save your hair. The only thing that is going to work is the use of strong prescription pharmaceuticals like finasteride and minoxidil. So next, let's get to his topical hair formula. It has changed a lot since its previous version. Here is a comparison between his new topical formula and the old one. As you can see, he has made a few minor tweaks, but also some major changes to the formula as well. Here are the minor tweaks. He has decreased the caffeine concentration from 1% to 0.2%. He has also increased the melatonin concentration from 0.0033% to 0.1%. Now, there is weak evidence for improved hair growth from both caffeine and melatonin, and I've made videos on both those topics that I'll link below if you're interested. So, I have no problem at all with Brian Johnson putting both of these ingredients in his topical formulation, even if the effect is probably minimal at best. However, I think I think he probably watched my original video criticizing his topical because he has cut out a lot of the bullshit ingredients in the original formula too. He cut out the azelic acid, the tea tree oil, the rosemary oil, the ginkgo biloba, diclofenic and biotin. So good riddance to all that rubbish. We already have way too many TikTok zoomer idiots promoting trash like that as it is. What Brian Johnson added to his topical includes vitamin D3 and vitamin E. I don't think either one is important in a topical formulation, though I must admit I do think oral vitamin D3 is is reasonable to take given the high percentage of people who have low vitamin D levels, which again, I talked about in a prior video on vitamin D. So next, I see that he has added cetirazine and latanoprost to his concoction. Both these drugs supposedly work by influencing prostaglandins and prostaglandin receptors as well. Cetirazine is an antihistamine which you may know better by its brand name of Zyrtec. However, in addition to its benefits in treating allergies, it also reduces the production of prostaglandin D2 and increases the production of prostaglandin E2. Prostaglandin D2 is a negative hair growth factor and prostaglandin E2 is a positive hair growth factor. In a study of 40 men with androgenic alopecia, 1% topical cetirazine solution was compared to 5% minoxidil solution. Cetirazine was successful in causing hair growth, but unfortunately, it wasn't as effective as 5% topical minoxidil. So it's reasonable to include cetirazine in the topical as a weak adjunctive therapy, though whether or not it adds anything to the other ingredients is unknown. The same thing is true for latanoprost. Latanoprost is a prostaglandin analog that stimulates the prostaglandin F receptor. It used to get a lot of hype in the hair loss community, but I have never seen seen or heard of anyone actually getting results from it, and these days, not many people really talk about it anymore. Latanoprost has been studied in men with androgenic alopecia, but the amount of research is minimal and very low quality. For example, in this study of just 16 men, Latanoprost appeared to increase hair growth, but this is a very small study here we're talking about, Jones. These prostaglandin modulating therapies have never been proven to be effective in large randomized controlled studies. It's theoretically possible, I suppose, that adding these prostaglandin drugs to Brian Johnson's topical may have some slight beneficial effect and they probably don't do any harm at least but these treatments have been around for a while now and they've definitely been around long enough that if they were really effective we'd probably know about it by now so let's go ahead and take a look at the big changes he's made in the formula first he increased the minoxidil concentration to seven percent so in my opinion this is a pretty odd thing to do and that's because even though there are preparations of seven percent minoxidil for sale there are no studies of seven percent minoxidil specifically that i am aware of there are three studies of high concentration concentration minoxidil, meaning 10% and 15%. One study showed improvement using 15% minoxidil versus 5% minoxidil. However, another study showed worse results with 10% minoxidil versus 5% minoxidil. A third study showed 10% minoxidil being effective in non-responders to 5% minoxidil, so that might be a good idea if you are a non-responder to 5% minoxidil. However, what's especially interesting about higher concentrations of topical minoxidil is that it appears that the maximum solubility of minoxidil is around 7.5%, which means that at higher concentrations, the minoxidil forms crystals and is inactivated. That may be why studies of 10% and 15% topical minoxidil are inconclusive, and maybe that's why Brian chose a concentration of 7%. But again, it's important to realize that there are no studies showing 7% topical minoxidil is superior to 5% topical minoxidil, and the the fact that a study showed that 10% was worse than 5% topical minoxidil really raises the possibility that 7% might be worse too. However, in addition to topical minoxidil, he also added tretinoin 0.0125%. Tretinoin enhances the conversion of minoxidil into minoxidil sulfate by stimulation of the sulfotransferase enzyme. Minoxidil sulfate is the active form of minoxidil, and so tretinoin can help improve the efficacy of minoxidil in minoxidil non-responders. So adding tretinoin to a stack is definitely reasonable. 
However, the big change here is that Brian Johnson has apparently abandoned topical finasteride and he is now using topical dutasteride at 0.25%. I think this is a very bad idea for two reasons. Reason number one, dutasteride is not well absorbed through the skin barrier. Dutasteride is a relatively large molecule with a molecular weight of 529 Daltons. In contrast, finasteride is a smaller molecule with a molecular weight of 373 Daltons. According to the 500 Dalton rule, which says that molecules bigger than 500 Daltons aren't well absorbed through the skin, dutasteride should not be well absorbed through the skin and studies have actually confirmed this. That's why special preparations are used to enhance dutasteride absorption, like wrapping dutasteride in lipid nanoparticles, which is what the form of topical dutasteride marketed by Zion is. Alternatively, there is also dutasteride that can be administered through mesotherapy injections, although it is worth mentioning that even mesotherapy is less effective than oral dutasteride. But Brian Johnson doesn't mention any of these special formulations, so it looks like he is just using plain old-fashioned 0.25% topical dutasteride in this solution. So since topical dutasteride is so poorly absorbed, it's probable that very little, if any, of this dutasteride is actually getting through the skin barrier. So Brian Johnson may very well be missing out on the most effective treatment for his androgenic alopecia, and that, of course, is a 5AR inhibitor. So it's crazy to me how someone who wants to live forever isn't even willing to join the dutasteride master race and just take dutasteride orally like he should be doing if he's actually serious about hair loss. And I haven't even mentioned the second reason to not use topical dutasteride, and that is the fact that there is very little data on the efficacy of it in treating hair loss. There is much more data on topical finasteride, and of course, even more data on oral finasteride and oral dutasteride. So, when it comes to 5-AR inhibiting drugs, oral drugs are always better, but if you insist on using topicals, then go with finasteride, as it is backed by much stronger evidence and doesn't have the same skin absorption limitations as dutasteride does. I went over all these limitations of topical dutasteride in a recent video, and I'll go ahead and link that video below if you haven't seen it yet, and I strongly encourage Brian Johnson to watch that video, as I think you'll find it very informative. So this is a very very bad idea on Brian's part. He has substituted topical dutasteride for topical finasteride, and in doing so, he may not be getting any of the vast benefits from being on a 5-air inhibiting drug. So Mr. Johnson, if you're watching this video, I know you're paying your team of researchers an exorbitant amount of money to research hair loss, but they're giving you bad advice. I'm telling you, what you should do is you should just hire me as your chief researcher instead, and all I ask for in return is a copy of Warhammer Space Marine 2 so I don't have to beg my wife's boyfriend to buy it for me this Christmas. Anyways, in all seriousness, Brian Johnson should stop fooling around with topical 5 air blockers and just take oral finasteride or dutasteride like a proper hair loss witcher should. I'm sure he's thinking that by taking dutasteride topically, he is minimizing his risk of side effects, but if he really wants to improve his chances of saving his hair, he should join the dutasteride master race and stop fooling around with all these silly and funny topical solutions. Just take the damn pill like an aspirin and forget about it. You very, very likely will not get side effects. And for someone who is so interested in prolonging his life, it's a shame that he's also missing out on the other potential life-prolonging benefits of oral 5 air blocking drugs that I've outlined in great detail in previous videos that I'll link below. And that should definitely matter to Brian Johnson because finasteride really is the ultimate longevity drug and Brian Johnson wants to live forever. So anyways, that's his new topical. It has some improvements, which I do give him credit for, but it also has some huge downsides too. So if we look further into his hair loss stack, we can see that he's still using that goofy red light helmet that Dr. Dre probably sold him. And like I said in my last video on Brian Johnson's hair loss stack, there is some weak evidence supporting the stimulating effects on hair growth of red light, but it is very weak evidence. And these light caps are very expensive and they are a complete waste of time and money for the vast majority of people. For example, in this study of 54 men with androgenic alopecia, low-level laser light therapy, LLLT, plus 5% minoxidil was compared to 5% minoxidil alone. In the study, laser light therapy did not add significantly to the results of just using topical minoxidil alone. So since Brian Johnson is already using topical minoxidil, it's not clear that the light helmet is adding anything to his treatment, and it is probably just a waste of time and money. But then again, we are talking about Brian Johnson here. He drives an Audi e-tron GT, while I just drive a Kia EV6 GT, so spending thousands 
millions of dollars on something minimally effective at best is obviously no huge loss for him. However, the next point he makes can't pass without criticism. Brian Johnson is now apparently taking oral minoxidil at 3.75 milligrams per day. He states that 5 milligrams of oral minoxidil is similar in efficacy to 5% topical minoxidil. That's probably true, so it makes you wonder, what is the point of using oral minoxidil when you are already using topical minoxidil, which you just stated is equally as effective? He even admits that oral minoxidil has side effects, though he doesn't mention the most serious side effect of them all, which is pericardial effusion with cardiac tamponade. Pericardial effusion is a buildup of fluid around the heart that can end up causing pressure and crushing the heart, which is what cardiac tamponade is. Pericardial effusion was a common side effect with standard dose oral minoxidil back when it was first introduced and used for treating high blood pressure. The problem was so severe that doctors stopped using it for high blood pressure and the topical form was developed specifically to avoid these very serious and potentially life-threatening side effects. Pericardial effusion has never been reported with topical minoxidil. However, it has been reported with oral minoxidil, even when used at a very low dose. So this is probably a pretty rare complication, but it is an extremely serious and life-threatening problem. And since the side effect appears to be idiosyncratic, using a low dose won't necessarily protect you from oral minoxidil's dangers, which I think would put off someone like Brian Johnson from using oral minoxidil since he wants to live forever and become the god emperor of Arrakis. <laughs> So if he wants to minimize the life-threatening side effects from drugs, he should probably dump the oral minoxidil and just stick with the topical variation of the drug that he's already using. Topical minoxidil is an actual hair loss drug. Oral minoxidil, on the other hand, is a last resort cardiovascular drug with a black box warning for its cardiovascular dangers that just so happens to promote hair growth as a side effect. So use the real hair loss drug and not the cardiovascular drug that has hair growth as a side effect. His sixth point has to do with a product for treating gray hair, which like I mentioned in the video on his previous hair stack, is completely ineffective. Most likely, Brian's hair is darkened just from using topical minoxidil. So, his seventh point is a blueprint hair health shampoo, which apparently is possibly coming soon, but since he gives no other information on this product, it's not possible to actually evaluate it yet. So let's go ahead and move on to his eighth point. His eighth point is also some unspecified new hair loss treatment in the pipeline that he hasn't released yet. He does mention that PRP didn't work for him, him, and he implies that this new treatment is some kind of PRP-like treatment, but he doesn't give any actual details, so we'll just have to wait and see what he does with this thing. Although I'm definitely not surprised that PRP didn't work for him, because PRP is both overrated and overpriced, and I'll go ahead and link my video on that topic below. So overall, I have mixed feelings about this. Brian Johnson has gotten rid of some of the garbage in his hair loss tonic, which is good of course, but he has also completely abandoned finasteride, which is the most potent treatment in the stack, all in favor of topical dutasteride, which is the least well studied of all five error blocker preparations and what little evidence exists suggests it doesn't work because of its very poor skin penetration. Worst of all, he has now started oral minoxidil, which isn't just dangerous, but also completely redundant since he is already using topical minoxidil. He seems completely oblivious to all the risk involved, which really makes me wonder, where in the hell is all the money going that he gives to his team of researchers? I have the feeling that it'll be on a different topical in six months or so because it looks like he constantly changes his formula depending on what he or his research team has read most recently in the medical literature without paying any attention to the level of evidence of the studies he reads. The ironic thing here is that if he just took oral finasteride or oral dutasteride and used topical minoxidil on top of that, he'd have equal or superior results to what he's using now. So I don't mean to give out a harsh tone here. I definitely still appreciate what Brian Johnson is doing and I hope he succeeds in his goal to make him himself and his hair immortal so that he can become the god emperor of Arrakis. But until we discover the spice melange, finasteride is definitely the best longevity drug we have right now. Once again, Mr. Johnson, you should really consider hiring me to be your lead hair loss researcher. I promise you, I can make your hair immortal. Just so long, of course, as you buy me Space Marine 2 for the PlayStation 5 and also promise to give me control of spice production on Arrakis 20,000 years from now. I think that's a pretty fair trade, wouldn't you say? Now, as for the rest of your future subjects, all I gotta say is, thank you for watching and long live the fighters i'll see y'all next time god bless